We are coming to you from inside the command center for DTE in downtown Detroit, a place that has been way too busy and trying to solve way too many problems over the last couple of weeks for the folks who work here. And that certainly includes the CEO of DTE, Jerry Norcia. Jerry, thanks so much for the time. Thank you, Devin, and good afternoon. Good to have yeah. you here. Uh, I, I, we really appreciate the invitation. I, it's not news to you to, to, for me to tell you that you have a lot of absolutely furious customers. Yes. What are you telling them? Well, we completely understand. Uh, you know, last Wednesday night we had a historic ice storm that, uh, you know, rolled through Wednesday night through Thursday night, and at the end of all of that, we had about 1.7 million customers that still had power. But that's what's not important. We had 630,000 customers without power uh, that evening, and uh, while we restored 50%, uh, you know, by uh, Friday night and 80% by Saturday night and 98% by Sunday night. Uh, we had uh, about 14 or 15,000 customers that rolled into Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And I just have to say to my customers, that's unacceptable uh, to have that lengthy of an outage. Uh, we've made tremendous investment in the system, which I'd like to talk to you about. Mm -hmm. uh, but we need to do more uh, so that all of our customers have the same experience that that 1.7 million customers had. And even in a historic ice storm, uh, the grid needs to stand up uh, to these increasingly severe weather patterns. So that's what I would like to say to my customers. We are going to do better, we will be better, and we're investing billions, and we'll, we'll talk a bit more about that. Um, but, and I also want to, just before we stop, um, is I'd like to certainly uh, show appreciation for the 4,000 people uh, that are out in the field, even today, uh, restoring power and making permanent repairs. Uh, we had 2,000 Michiganders, uh, including 1,000 DT employees, as well as 2,000 out-of-state workers that came to assist, and uh, just want to express my, my gratitude uh, to them. We know it takes an army yeah. to try to run this, even in the best of circumstances, then you have conditions like this. But we also had a big problem with expectation management. Uh, you know, don't tell me my power is going to be back on on Sunday if I'm going to not actually see power until the following Tuesday or Wednesday. I mean, where was the, why was that mistake made in, in maybe underestimating what it took to get back online? That, that's a great question. You know, we uh, get these type of ice storms every 50 or 60 years. So typically when we produce an estimate, it's based on our historic um, instances where we've had outages and so many customers and, and so many devices that, are, that appear uh, disabled on this screen, and we make an estimate. But when you arrive on a job and you actually see the damage, uh, it was a lot more expensive, extensive than any of our models had predicted. That's why we, on, on Thursday and Friday, we brought an incremental thousand workers in because the damage was much worse. So when we arrived at the job, we found that it was going to take a lot longer to repair. And that's why estimates changed. Not ideal, not great for our customers, uh, but these are very rare events uh, that are happening more and more often. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Rare, but increasingly yes. less rare. We had a huge wind problem last summer, as a matter of fact, last August, where we had lots of outages. Right. We were told then the DTE was making lots of changes and lots of improvements. I want you to talk about those because sure. it would appear that they're not enough yet. They're not enough yet. I think that's a correct conclusion. Uh, we've invested about five and a half billion dollars in the grid over the last five years and done thousands and thousands of miles of tree trimming. And over the next five years, we'll invest over $9 billion in the grid. So we are making fundamental investments to have a vast and class grid. And what's happening, Devin, is these events that used to happen every 50 or 60 years are happening every two or three years. The weather patterns are fundamentally changing. And we started seeing this happening about five to seven years ago. And that's why we've ramped our tree trimming by 300%. We've got 1,500 tree trimmers on site every day trimming trees. We've got over a thousand line workers um, improving uh, the infrastructure with a billion and a half a year of capital being invested uh, last year and uh, just as much this year and about nine billion over five years. So we are investing heavily and where we've made the investments, it's been fabulous performance. We get, uh, for example, in Detroit in the last five years, we've seen a 45% reduction in outages just in the city of Detroit where we've invested extremely heavily. Every state right now though is dealing with increased and more hyperactive weather, it would seem. And yet, I, you're, I'm sure you're familiar with the Citizens Utility Board breakdown uh, that shows that Michigan has the fifth worst efficiency when it comes to, and, and reliability when it comes to utilities in the country. I thought, well, Michigan has more trees maybe. I start looking into it. Washington State, second best. Uh, Minnesota, ninth best. Even Wisconsin, I think 24th or 25th best. Why are we lagging uh, the rest of the country in our reliability of our, of our systems? Well, great question. Let me break it down for you. So there's really two components to reliability. One is the number of outages. 
into the amount of time that it takes to restore those outages. So from a number of outages perspective, we're about average in a country, which is still not great. We don't have the best grid in terms of number of outages and the frequency of outages. The duration is below average, the amount of time that it takes to restore. Now you might say, why is that? Well, about 16,000 miles of our grid is quite old, was built in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And uh, in very older, uh, older cities like Detroit, Gross Point, Royal Oak, Birmingham, uh, have a very uh, aging set of uh, grid equipment. And uh, what we need to do, and it also doesn't have automation, and I think I was describing you earlier, mm -hmm. once you introduce more and more automation, that's why we built this control center, because the old control center couldn't take all of the automation uh, data coming in, this one will. And as we introduce more and more automation, we can isolate outages from this control center. So if a tree goes down and knocks a wire down and knocks a pole down, we can isolate that location and send our crew right to the block where the issue is and restore all of the other customers that need to side of the outage immediately. So you take a 1,000 customer outage that lasts six or seven hours into a 100 customer outage that lasts six or seven hours because you restore the rest of them immediately. So that's what's required on the systems, it, automation, and we also need to upgrade the poles and wires and transformers, 16,000 miles of it, so that it performs at the same level as the other 75% of our grid. Which I'm assuming is part of why you've, <laughs> two weeks before this all happened, were requesting a rate increase. You need more investment, but the timing was not lost on a lot of people. You're going to ask me more for more money when my service is what it is. Well, what uh, the reality is, is that for four years, we have not asked for a price increase uh, in our delivery rates, and we've invested $8 billion into the grid. And uh, if we're going to invest another $9 billion in the grid, we're asking uh, for about an 8 to $9 per month increase that you know, covers that four years without any increase and also some future investments. Uh, I want to get to, we've, we've received a ton of questions for me to ask you. Yes. One of them uh, said, I spent hundreds of dollars on hotels and food and DTE is only giving me a $35 credit. Why can't you reimburse me for the total losses? I want to ask you about the $35 credit. A lot of people found that insulting and a lot of people were telling me it was worse than giving me nothing. What is $35 for? Well, look at the $35, I would agree, is not going to cover the type of expenses that an extended outage uh, would cause, you know, uh, hotel stays, uh, loss of food, and that sort of thing. And when we work with our regulator, we're trying to find a balance for how much do we reimburse for an outage versus how much do we reinvest in making the future better uh, and making the grid better. In addition to that, beyond that, uh, Devin, just so that you know, uh, we've partnered with local agencies on um, supplying uh, food resources to customers that are, have the least amount of resources among us, amongst us, so our low-income customers. We are going to contact all of those that were uh, impacted, as well as generally a great number of those that uh, are in need of uh, food resources. So we are going to do that above and beyond with our foundation. Uh, one of the other questions that we got often, what is being done, you've talked about this a little, what is being done to prevent this from happening again? As we head into the spring, we know that's really when we're supposed to get ice storms. We have uh, future problems ahead of us. What can we do in the short term to try to make sure that we don't have that kind of outage? We just need to continue investing, Devin. This is going to be a long-term solution. Uh, you know, the, the grid has aged over many decades. And as we uh, tackle mile after mile of the grid uh, and be, remain persistent and continue to invest, we need to invest heavily in this grid to prepare it for two things. One is the fact that worsening uh, pattern, uh, climate patterns are worsening and the attacks on our grid are becoming more yeah. and more violent yeah. from a weather perspective. But two, we've also got growing demand coming, which is EVs. So we need to prepare for both. And that's why these investments are fundamental in the future prosperity of Michigan. We need a reliable grid a safe grid to ensure the future prosperity of this state. Those who are very cynical about the, trans, uh, the transfer into EV, the EV future, this is one of the things they point out, that our grid is in no way ready for that. You look at the investments that the, the, that the state is making right now, uh, are you convinced that we can handle it? We can handle it if we continue to make the investments that we're making in the grid, you know, as we continue to transform uh, the condition of our grid with $9 billion going in over the next five years. It's going to fundamentally change in five years, and in 10 years, uh, we'll have invested perhaps over $20 billion into the grid. It is a significant investment to prepare for, for uh, both of these eventualities, which is increasingly worsening weather patterns as well as uh, EV demand. We're attaching about 1,000 EVs uh, every month to our grid. Governor Whitmer said uh, this past week, 
we've got to make sure that we've got accountability here. She's talking about you, isn't she? I think she's talking about me and the entire company. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're happy to be accountable for where we make our investments and improve the quality of the grid. Uh, like I said, 75% of the grid uh, operated just fine during a historic ice storm. And uh, we need to show that the investments that we're making are increasing the number of uh, customers that can sustain that type of uh, attack on the grid. And we will do that. We're happy to do that. Uh, the last question I wanted to ask then, if we are the fifth worst in the country at reliability, how long can it reasonably take for us to move up much, much higher where we belong? I would say that uh, you know we've been investing heavily for the last five years, and over the next five years, I think we will climb that ladder to being at least median performance, and then we're going to continue to uh, build a best-in-class grid and build a flawless grid for our customers and for the citizens of Michigan. Which they, takes, they deserve it. Which takes how long, though? I would say it would take a decade. A decade to oh. be best in class. Yep. I do have actually one more question because this is the other question that we get all the time. Places. Uh, New builds often get their lines put in the ground. Correct. Um, everybody wants to know, at a certain point, as expensive as it is, doesn't it make more sense to get those power lines down and put them in the ground? As expensive as it can be, look how expensive it was to keep them in the air these past couple of weeks. Well, it's a great question, and about a third of our system is underground now. Uh, Two-thirds that was built before the 1960s uh, is above ground, uh, especially in the uh, sort of residential neighborhoods. All residential neighborhoods that are built today and also commercial establishments all go underground. Uh, we are looking to see, can we bring the cost down? Because right now it's a multiple, putting lines underground is, costs multiple times more than putting the lines, uh, or leaving the lines up in the air. But as we rebuild this grid and, and really try to transform that 16,000 miles, which is the oldest part of our grid, yeah. we're gonna look really hard at how much of that can we uh, put underground and we're gonna, see if we can compress the cost and get the cost down. I think the more we try and the more we do, uh, we can find ways to make that more and more efficient. So we are committed to, to trying it and making it happen. Yeah, that's a question we get a lot. Yeah. Jerry, thanks for, thanks for Thank having you, us Devin. here. Really appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah.